a truck driver was hauling a load of 500 penguins to the zoo. Unfortunately, his truck broke down. So eventually, he waved down another truck and offered the driver $500 to take the penguins to the zoo. The next day, the first truck driver got his truck fixed and drove into the town and couldn't believe his eyes. Just ahead of him, he saw the second truck driver crossing the road with the 500 penguins following him in a single file behind him. He jumped out of his truck, ran up to the guy and said, what's going on? I gave you $500 to take these penguins to the zoo. To which the man responded, I did take them to the zoo, but I had enough money left over, so now we are going to the movies. <laughs> that guy didn't fully understand what he was supposed to be doing. Success without purpose is life without meaning. Think about it. Success without purpose is life without meaning. Many times we want success in life. We celebrate people who are successful because they have accomplished something that the world celebrates. But pay attention to this. If the success is not tied up to purpose, then it's not truly success. Success without purpose is life without meaning. Earlier we heard in one of the sermons a story of two men digging a big hole on the road. And they were, one was digging a hole from morning till evening. And the guy that next stood next to him was filling the hole. So one guy was digging all the dirt and the other guy stood next to him filling it. And one man observed this and he says, what's going on here? So he went to him, couldn't satisfy his curiosity, went to him and said, what's happening? Why are you digging the hole and why is he filling it with dirt again? He said, we are actually three people job. I'm supposed to dig the hole. Another man is supposed to plant the tree and the third guy is supposed to fill it back again with the dirt. But the middle guy has fallen sick today. So we are still doing our job. Many times in life, this is what happens if you do not have a clear purpose on why we do what we do. That is why it is important for every generation in every season and every stage of life to take a step back and to ask the most important question, why, why are we doing what we're doing? Why do I exist? Why am I here? So this is important for us this morning as we consider. Why? Because if you do not have a higher purpose in life, if you don't find your higher purpose, and you don't have a clear picture of your higher purpose in life, you will fall for your lower passions. If you don't have a higher purpose in life, you will join your lower companions in life. If you don't find your higher purpose, you will settle for lower performance in life. If you don't have a higher purpose, you will settle for lower performance. If you don't find your higher purpose, you will invest your resource into lower ventures. If you don't find your higher purpose, you will enjoy lower pleasures. If you don't find your higher purpose, you will travel life's lower paths. If you don't find your higher purpose, you will sit in lower seats at king's banquets. If you don't find your higher purpose, you will end up lowly in your own eyes. We do need to find our purpose so that success without purpose is life without meaning. So we understand our purpose so we can truly be successful. Today, I want to bring you to a text, a narrative passage of scripture found in Genesis chapter 18 and verses 17 to 19. This is a statement made by God, a dialogue that God has within himself. 
And I want you to think about this because I'm going to use an NASB translation, New American Standard Bible. And I want you to read it together with me so that and pay attention to some of the prepositional phrases we're going to point out this morning. Look at this. The Lord shall, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation. I want you to circle that word, will surely become. God is very certain. Will become a great and mighty nation and in him, circle those two words. That's the first propositional phrase. In him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Verse 19, for I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. I want you to go back, 19a. He says, for I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him. Circle that two words, after him. To keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. That's the third one I want you to circle. There are three words, three phrases I want to highlight. In him, after him, and about him. What the Lord is saying here about Abraham is God is about to do something in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, because I know that Abraham will become a mighty nation, a great and a mighty nation, and in him all the nations will be blessed. Because I have chosen him, for I have chosen him. Therefore, will I not reveal to him what I'm about to do? So God was making a statement about Abraham's destiny. Why did God say, I, can, I would not hide this from Abraham? Because it concerns Abraham's future. It concerns Abraham's purpose. It concerns Abraham's destiny in life. So as I look at this text, I want to just consider three keys to ultimate purpose. Three keys as we examine these texts. And I'm going to use these three propositional phrases to examine these texts. In him, after him, and about him. In him, the three keys are these. First one, I'll give it to you all three so you can write it down. Number one, the life we live within. It says in him, within him. In other words, the life we live within. Secondly, the legacy we leave behind. It says after him, the legacy we leave behind. Thirdly, the keys to purpose involves the glory we have above. In other words, the Lord said, I will fulfill my promise to him that I've spoken about him. The glory we have about. Let's look at it one at a time. The Bible says in verse 18, in him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him the life we live within i think many of you know from the bible college and the lessons you've heard preached from this pulpit that when we think of a man's life we always think of it in terms of three structures a man's life compress comprises of a superstructure which is what the world will see and celebrate which is his accomplishments and his achievements, his abilities, his appearance, his acquisitions, and all his net worth. These are the things that the world celebrates. That's the superstructure of life. And then there are like a visible, invisible structures that are holding this superstructure. So what gives structure to a man's life? His time alone with God, his time alone with his wife, his time alone with his children, Things that how he manages his finances, how he manages his time, his life, that gives him structure. But then there is something that eyes cannot see, even your closest relatives will not know about you. What is it? It is your substructure. It is the foundation of your life. Just like in this building, 
We are impressed by the superstructure. There are beams that's holding it. There are structures giving it the capacity to carry the weight. But it is all built on an invisible foundation which we can't see. The only time foundation can be seen is when there is a crack. Only when people pay attention to foundations in life, only when there is a crisis. The most important life that you and I are called to live is not our superstructures. The most important life we are called to live is not even the structures, but the substructure, because that is what God is after. So in the eyes of God, what is of great importance is not our superstructure. What is of great importance to God is what happens in our substructures, the heart, our inner life. That's why throughout scriptures, God always speaks about the heart. He says, guard your heart, for out of it will flow issues of life. He always says, I search your heart. Why? Because your heart reveals the motive, why you do what you do. The heart truly reveals the purpose, why you do what you do. Because God wants to see ultimately the heart behind everything. That is why before God, what matters is not the external. What matters is internal. What matters is the inner life. That's why in a disciple-making church, we keep talking about the life we live within because we are so many times we are impressed by what happens outside. I remember reading about Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal, this is uh, from the book Coming Home, Timeless Wisdom for Families by Dr. James Dobson. He writes in it that Taj Mahal is one of the most beautiful and costly tombs ever built. But there is something fascinating about, about its beginnings. In 1629, when the favorite wife of Indian ruler Shah Jahan died, he ordered that a magnificent tomb be built as a memorial to her. The Shah placed his wife's casket in the middle of a parcel of land and construction of the temple literally began around it. But several years into the venture, the Shah's grief for the wife gave way to the passion for the project. One day while he was surveying the site, he reportedly stumbled over a wooden box and he had some workers throw it out. It was months before he realized that his wife's casket had been destroyed. The original purpose for the memorial became lost in the details of construction. This is what happens. We pay attention to the external life. We pay attention to what we achieve and how we can impress and be celebrated and validated and applauded by our human beings, peers. But what we neglect is what is of ultimate importance. The greatest purpose is to live a life within the life that is pleasing before God. I remember one time talking to a dear friend of mine who is a church member here. At that time, he was, he was just visiting us and he wasn't a member. And he was in a real distress and turmoil. And so when I met Dr. Bobby Rigoso, it was in a place where he was going through a lot of confusion about his future. He had been a GP, a practicing GP for nearly 20 something years. In fact, a very good one has very good clientele. And he was, he was struck with this disease, cancer. And after struggling through that in the first phase, the medical board revoked his license to practice. So in one year, he lost almost all his business practice. He had to sell his business at a loss. He would he would come to a place where he didn't have any purpose to his life because his life was all about doing, being a doctor and helping people. So when I met him and his wife, I was processing this thing through with him 
And one of the things that the Lord laid upon my heart is that he need to bring a closure to this. That his identity is bigger than being a doctor. His identity is who he is in God. He has a purpose beyond practicing medicine. So one of the things I had to help him is to bring closure to this. So one counsel I gave him is, because it has been taken away from you, you haven't had time to let go. So can I humbly ask you to do this? Take your wife and your children on a holiday. Just go somewhere. Bring your stethoscope and everything that reminds you of being a doctor. And just celebrate your 20-something years of being a doctor. And once you have celebrated it, just announce it like you're retiring from this. And then you bury the whole stethoscope. And then when you come out of that, you say, now that chapter of my life is over. I'm moving towards the future that God has. I'm no longer a practicing doctor. I'll be a doctor for something else. Cut the long story short, he came back. He immediately, he actually went home and called his wife and said, we are going on a holiday. He just took wife and, and the family met him a few days later. Long story short, he came back so changed. What happened? He had lost purpose for his life. When something had been tragically removed, that is external, it affects the internal. How many people are so hung up on their identity of, of their career, of their work, of their net worth, of their wealth that they have, the family background they come from. But when something is taken away from you, you don't have a purpose. That is because we learn to build our purpose and identity upon things that are external. But in the eyes of God, it is the life you live within that matters. And that's where we need to come back. So one of the things he, I gave him as a framework, I'll give you a framework because this is something I teach pastors. Four things, can do, can't do, won't do, must do. I asked him to think about his life in these four quadrants. Write everything about your life in can do. Oh, I can do this, I can do that, I can do this. Then write about your life, what you can't do. And then you need to ask yourself, just because I can do, do I, do I must do? Must I do this? Why? Because you've got to ask your question, in this stage of my life, what God has called me to do, what is the defining things that I need to be doing? And when you are more clear on that, you can move some stuff from can do to won't do. Just because I can do, I won't do. Why? Because there are things that govern my life I must do. That clarity of knowing what it is that you must do with your life, with the time you have left, is very critical for life. That's why the Lord was saying to Abraham, in him, because within him, the life we live within is of the ultimate purpose. The second key to purpose that I want to talk to you about, the legacy we leave behind. The Lord was saying about Abraham in verse 19, for I have chosen him, NASB, for I have chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. There is something after you, the legacy we leave behind. How many of you have watched that movie, Castaway? It's one of my favorite movies. I do like Tom Hanks very much. He's a character actor. And one of the, in the movie, there's a line, you know, you, if you don't know the movie, let me give you a summary. Here is a man who works for FedEx. And what they, what they love about his life is his life, in the beginning of the movie, it will be shown to you that he is always about keeping time. Everything. The world should function on time. He's in control over every minute details of a package moving from the, from the person that it, who's sending it to the, to the office, where, warehouse where it goes to be sorted, and then it has to reach the person. So everything has to be precision. So you find his life is like that, well managed, controlled. And then suddenly something happens. He's involved in a plane, plane crash and he ends up in an island, a remote island. 
and he spends four years. At the end of the four years, he gets rescued and he comes home to find that his beloved has married another and has a family. That's a spoiler. <laughs> but he has a conversation with his friend. And that's what my whole point was. He had a conversation with his friend. The friend said to him, you know, Chuck, his name was Chuck Noland. You know, Chuck, we actually had a funeral for you. And in that funeral, when the casket was lowered, we threw in a few things that represented your life for us. You want to know what it was? A cell phone, a beeper, and an Elvis Presley CD. At the end of his life, what represented his life was a cell phone, a beeper, and an Elvis Presley, Presley CD. You and I, we need to ask the fundamental question. Can I give you three questions to ask about your own life? Because you may be in a season of life where you have a whole life ahead of you. Maybe you're in a season of life where you only have a few years ahead of you. Irregardless of what you have in, ahead of you, you need to evaluate what is the legacy I'm leaving behind. So can I give you three questions? Number one, what best represents your life? What best represents your life? If they are going to talk about you in your funeral, what are, you, what are they going to talk about? What best represents your life? Ask yourself this question. Secondly, what are the greatest assets of your life? What do you consider as your greatest asset in your life? What are you leaving behind? Number three, this is a question if you have a future in front of you. This is a question. What determines, what actually, what things actually determine your direction? Because you can, if your direction right now that you're heading into is a good indicator, predictor of what your life is about. Ask yourself these questions because you and I, we need to evaluate our life. And as, as Chuck Nolan was asked this, you and I, we need to ask this. And I look at Abraham's life. Abraham's life, the Lord says, there is a legacy that is behind him. After him comes his children. According to the scriptures, the most important legacy you will ever leave behind, it's not buildings, it's not books you have written, it's not conferences where you have attended or preached. At the end of the day, the best thing you will leave behind, the legacy you leave behind is people. And in the eyes of God, the people he points out to Abraham is his children and his household that are coming after him. That's why the most important thing you and I, we need to acknowledge is how are we doing in relationships? Over the years, I have ministered to people who are in their deathbeds. I've never once heard anyone talk about how he wishes he makes more money, how he wished he traveled the world and see all the famous, famous buildings in the world. Or he has eaten in all these famous Michelin star restaurants in the world. Everyone who is in their deathbed always acknowledge one thing, and that is, I wish I had spent more time with my family or with my dear ones, with my loved ones. Why is that? Because ultimately, that is the legacy, and that's why God was saying to him, Abraham, surely you will become a great and mighty nation, but pay attention to one thing that is fundamental and very vital. What is it? Your children and your children's children. Your legacy is your children and your children's children. What you do with them. Jesus, at the end of his three, year, three and a half year ministry, didn't leave behind a book, didn't build any buildings, but he left people that he had poured his life into. That's why in a disciple-making church, we always ask this one important question. Who are you investing your life into? Who are you discipling? And for me as a pastor, I need to stand before God and ask, ask myself the same question. Because one day, that's what I will be giving account for. What did you do with the people I've given you? That ultimately, 
it is not what you do for them, it is what you do in them, what you cultivate in them. The one thing we cultivate is a heart after God. The one we cultivate is a model to cultivate a heart for God, a heart to serve Him, to love Him. So the greatest delight that mom and dad has is not what they do in their life. The greatest delight that mom and dad should have is, my son loves Jesus. My daughter loves Jesus. And if there's one thing we can leave as a deposit in their life, it should be a love for the Lord. That is the purpose that will stand strong all the days of their life. Not only that, the Bible says God not only came to Abraham and said, Abraham, surely Abraham will become a great and mighty nation. I want you to think about this. The third key for purpose. The first key for purpose is the life we live within. The second key for purpose is the legacy we leave behind. The third key for purpose is the glory we have above. Surely, Abraham, you will become a great and mighty nation. That was not the concern of the Lord. You know what the concern of the Lord was? That in him, the nations will be blessed. But again, that was not Abraham's doing. Listen to me carefully. Many times what we, what we fail to understand is we, we try to engineer. Now, if you listen to a leadership guru or you listen to a life coach, they will say, you want to know your purpose? This is how your purpose is defined. This is how your purpose is defined. Be awakened to who you are, what you want to be. You're the master of your own ship. You're the captain of your own ship. You're the master of your own destiny. So stand before the mirror and say, I am. And say whatever you want. Because that's what you want to be. What you can conceive, you can achieve. What you can believe, you can receive. What you can visualize, you can actualize. Because it's up to you. The world is your oyster. You, the world is for your taking. Can I humbly say, Abraham did not go before God and say, Lord, make me a great and mighty nation. The whole passage is more God-centered, not man-centered. It was God who said, I have chosen him. The Lord says, I have laid hold of Abraham's life for a purpose. I have laid hold of Abraham for a purpose. What is that purpose? That purpose is that in him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And look at verse 19 towards the end. So that, this is the second part of verse 19. So that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. You and I cannot bring about what God has spoken. God brings it about. So what you and I do? We don't achieve it, we receive it. We position ourselves to go before God and we say, Lord, give us grace. Open my eyes. Help me to see you and to love you and to follow you, to serve you. The glory we have is this church. That we have a God who has spoken things concerning our lives. You and I, we should never forget this. The Bible says he's a God who declares the end from the beginning. Before he released you on this earth, he has already concluded your life. If he didn't conclude your life, he would not allow you to come into this world. He's a God who finishes from the beginning. He's already concluded. This is important for us to understand. We are not trying to make something happen blindly. We know clearly He is a God in heaven who created me for a life in Him. My life is His. He created me. He redeemed me. I am His. And because I'm His, He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a destiny. He will fulfill that. All I have to do is to keep His commands. And to keep my family in the Lord to keep their commands that's what it was very simple for Abraham God has already spoken you believe and follow the Lord exciting future awaits you 
this is the most important thing you and I we need to understand. When Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, wrote a book, which is a very famous book now. More than 35 million copies have been sold. It's a purpose-driven life. He summarized the entire book on this one premise. Your life, your purpose in life is not about you. It is about God. And God has these purposes for you. And he summarizes in his entire book, 40 chapters is based on only five key things. Can I give you these five things? Number one, you were planned for God's pleasure. In other words, you were created to worship God. You were planned for God's pleasure. Number two, you were formed for God's family. You were formed for a community. God wanted relationship. That's why he created you. God wanted relationship. That's why he sent his son to die for you. So you can come back to fellowship with him in his family. So you were planned for God's pleasure. You were formed for God's family. Number three, you were created to become like his son Jesus that is called discipleship not only that you were shaped for service God has a plan for you that's why he gave you the unique personality the temperaments the 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 things that you have the the educational background your ethnicity everything is designed around the purpose for which you have been created it is to serve his purposes number five you were made for a mission in all these five things he summarized it to say your life is not about you your life is about him what he wants to accomplish in you and this is what he wants to accomplish in you he created you to worship him he created you to be in fellowship with his family he created you for discipleship to become like jesus he created you to serve the lord by using your gifts and you were made for a mission and you know what that mission is to tell the world about jesus and that was the mission even for Abraham. Verse 18 says, In you the nations of the earth will be blessed. I want to just highlight that. What was Abraham's future? God promised him two things, land and seed. God gave him a land and in that land when they dwelt, he gave him a seed. Seed is the promised son. And out of his loins came a promised son. The son was David, king of Israel. And out of this David came a son, Jesus Christ. And this Jesus Christ of Nazareth one day died on the cross for the sin of the whole world because this Jesus, his lineage is from Abraham through David, but the seed came from God. He is fully man, fully God. God found a virgin and gave her the seed the Holy Spirit came upon her and she conceived. And the Bible says, Jesus Christ was born. And when he was born, in him, the whole world will be blessed. Why? Because you and I, when God created us, he created us sinless and perfect to fellowship with him, to have relationship with him. But you and I rebelled when our grandparents, Adam and Eve, rebelled in the Garden of Eden. They walked away from God. Right at that moment, God had already declared a seed will come. See, you and I, we need to understand God was not shocked when Adam and Eve fell into sin. Why? Because even when God was creating them, He said, let us form man in our own image. The Bible says at that moment, He had already decided that Jesus will die. Because the Bible says in the New Testament, behold the Lamb of God that was slain the Lamb of God that was slain from when? Not just 2,000 years ago. A Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, long before earth was formed, long before man was created, long before any of these things was happening, the Bible says, God had already purposed in His heart that one day He would send His own Son, Jesus, to live a perfect life that man could never live. And to take man's place and to die the death of a sinner that man deserved. And through that process, redeem mankind. 
and those who believe in Jesus will be saved. They will have eternal life. And they will have life with God in this world and life with God in eternity. What an amazing opportunity. And that was what God was pointing to. In Abraham, in Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because Jesus of Nazareth will come from him. Today, church, your purpose and my purpose is not outside of Jesus. It is in Jesus. Only when you give your life to Jesus, you truly understand your life's purpose. Because only when Jesus comes and occupies your heart, only when Jesus comes and takes hold of your life, you can deal with the true problem. The true problem is sin, separation from God. That can go only when you give your life to Jesus. Not only that, when you learn to love him, when you learn to serve him, when you learn to share about him, you are living your fullest potential. You're living your purpose. Anything else, being the number one in any sphere of life, being a global influencer, doing this, doing that, that the world will celebrate, all will know that I'm doing this, doesn't really matter. You know why? Because you would have lost on what truly matters. What ultimately matters, it's the ultimate reality. It is the ultimate truth that God created you for himself and God redeemed you for himself and when you know this truth and you live your life from this truth that will give you your purpose in life your purpose is intimacy with God every single day of our lives intimacy with him to enjoy Jesus to enjoy God's company in my life that's why we can live a rested life we can live a worry-free life why we have God and we are filled with purpose and meaning and one day, when we close our eyes here and look to go into heaven, we spend eternity with Him. That is the ultimate purpose, to be with Jesus, both now and in eternity. Every head bow, every eye close all across this place.